All right. Thanks a lot again uh, for the invitation to be with you this afternoon, and, and uh, Karina is going to get my slides up here for me. Uh, what I'm going to cover with you in the next uh, 25 minutes or so is a little bit, uh, mainly pictures on uh, my experiences with uh, storing some of these byproducts and so on. And so what, what I'm going to do is just kind of step you through some of the things that uh, I've seen um, working with various producers over the years in terms of getting some of these products stored and, and how to handle them. So you've all heard of Murphy's Law, right? Keith, what's Murphy's Law? Yeah, whatever can go wrong will go wrong. But you know what O'Toole's Law is, don't you? Have you heard of O'Toole's Law? O'Toole's Law was that Murphy was an optimist. So there's days when a lot of things are going to go wrong, and, and uh, this is actually uh, Miles City, Montana. I don't know if any of you are familiar with downtown Miles City, but there's a fairly low bridge. It's pretty well marked, but uh, this guy didn't read the signs. So I think uh, sometimes in life we've got to read the road signs a little bit better than we do and, and pay attention a little bit more. So in terms of wheat middlings, uh, this is a byproduct, again, that uh, is going to come out of the plant about 85% dry matter or so, about 15% moisture. They do add just a little bit of water to the wheat when they mill it typically. And so generally when you, when you get this product in, uh, if you try to store it in a conventional bin without any aeration, you're going to end up with some bridging and some mold issues. So the best way to store this product is to really try to get it into some kind of uh, flat storage typically, uh, commodity shed, or into a bin where you've got some aeration where you can get a little bit of airflow onto that and, and draw that moisture down just a little bit. But, you know, these commodity sheds don't have to be anything real elaborate. Uh, this is just a picture of one uh, from uh, south central Minnesota. This would be a, a open front shed where they've got a, a metal roof on top and uh, concrete dividers. But I've seen these done with, you know, simply using uh, the uh, barriers that they use in highway construction, that sort of thing. So it doesn't have to be anything real fancy, but uh, with the wheat mids, uh, that's one where flat storage really does work pretty good. Uh, potato waste, this is a byproduct, again, that's going to be very high in moisture. And this is a picture of a feedlot uh, up in the Jamestown area. Uh, and again, this product out of Jamestown, out of Cavendish, is going to be about... Uh, 25% dry matter or so, so in terms of potato waste, that's a little drier product than what would come out of Grand Forks, but uh, this particular operation is simply using a, a concrete bunker, uh, actually a, a silage pit, uh, to store this stuff in, and you can see uh, it, it does have, a, it's wet enough where it's, it's going to have a tendency to run, so it's running to the low end of that uh, particular bunker. The other thing to remember about this product is, is it does get a little bit acidic in terms of what it does to concrete, so it will peel a finish off of concrete eventually when you store this product in concrete. Uh, but you can see that, that when he goes in and gets a scoop out of it, the bucket full, uh, it does, you can, you can kind of scoop it up. It's not that runny. Um, the product out of Grand Forks, uh, this is a picture of a storage facility uh, near Northwood, North Dakota. Uh, just an earthen uh, dam, basically, to store this product in, uh, back in and dump it out of tanker trucks in there and then pump it out of the other end. So the, the potato waste product, you know, depending on, on the, the uh, consistency and the moisture content, it's going to vary a little bit in terms of how, what approach you might want to take to store it. In terms of feeding it, there's, there's a number of different ways you can approach with, with feeding that particular byproduct. Uh, in this case, uh, this operation is simply taking it and putting it into turn tires and letting the cattle drink it. Uh, you can also put it in, the, obviously mix it in the ration and feed it as a component of the ration. Uh, I think I've got one other picture here. Uh, this is just uh, feeding it uh, in, in a little larger tank system and again letting the cattle drink it. But uh, there's, there's a number of different ways you can approach the potato waste product, but they will, with with the liquid nature of the product out of Grand Forks, obviously drink quite a bit of that product uh, as, as a component of their diet. So the, the sugar beets and the sugar beet byproducts, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about those. Uh, from the standpoint of the tailings, 
this is simply a picture of uh, tailings that I think this uh, particular picture came out of the Galesburg area, if I remember right. Uh, simply bring them in, uh, piling them in, in an area where you've got an existing silage pile. Uh, this particular pile was not packed or anything. They're kind of feeding these on the go, and so they're not really a long-term storage with, with this particular pile of tailings. They were keeping these uh, fed up within a week or so after they got them. And, uh, you know, with the cooler temperatures or colder temperatures that we typically have during the sugar beet processing campaign, uh, you can do that, you know, and keep tailings around in fairly good condition probably for a week to 10 days uh, without um, having to do any kind of long-term storage with them. If you get into uh, later in the season, this is a picture, I think it was taken uh, mid-summer, probably late June time frame. Uh, down in the Lisbon area, you can see this particular product, you're starting to get some discoloration to it that's been stored a little bit longer term. Uh, the campaign probably ended uh, early May, and these, these tailings have been piled in there since then uh, and not packed or, or tried to put into any kind of uh, pack storage kind of, of operation. But you can see how that's kind of discolored. It's starting to, to uh, turn a little bit. Uh, and like Galen mentioned, I'd, I'd encourage you when, you when you think about working with these products and doing any kind of storage with them, that taking that shrink and storage into account uh, as you work with it is important. Because, you know, when you start talking about uh, 10 to 15, 20% shrink on some of these products as you get them into storage, that re represents a significant cost to your operation. And it's something that should be accounted for when you start looking at whether or not these products are a good buy for your cattle operation. Okay, in terms of sugar beet pulp, this is a picture of, of pulp simply that comes off the truck out of the plant. And our experience here uh, at NDSU, and we've done work with sugar beet pulp in the past, we've, we've brought it in and used it as we, as we needed it. Uh, typically trying to get it fed up within a week to 10 days of, of when we get it delivered. But we've also put uh, sugar beet pulp into egg bags for a little bit longer term storage. And uh, we've had pretty good luck bagging this product. It, it is fairly bulky, but it will go into egg bags or those silage bags fairly well. Uh, like I said, it's probably going to cost you somewhere around five to six bucks a ton uh, for that egg bag type storage. And so the, the question you get into on your own operations, I think, is whether or not that cost and additional investment in the storage uh, is worth it. Uh, one of the things that we've noticed when, when we've stored it, either in the bags or uh, in, in piles like this, is, is when it's exposed to air, it will develop a little bit of a orangish, almost a fluorescent orange colored mold on it. Uh, we've tested a number of those samples over the years for the mycotoxins and, and uh, other molds and really not come up with anything that you'd say is really uh, setting off alarm bells in terms of, of uh, feeding it to cattle. But I, I would caution you that, you know, some of this stuff, uh, you know, even if you don't see visible mold, you can have some mycotoxins present. And the major concern is not necessarily with growing and finishing cattle, but really with your bred cows and whether or not you're getting some mycotoxin ingestion in there with, with the gestating cows. This is a picture from uh, the Miller, North Dakota area, a little bit longer term storage of quite a bit of pulp. Uh, these guys were, were pushing it up and, and in the background you can kind of see the silage pile. They're, they're pushing it up against the silage pile and, and trying to pack it. But most cases, my experience has been you're not going to get uh, really on top of a sugar beet pulp pile uh, much more than, than maybe eight feet high or so with a tractor and, and trying to get it packed because it's just kind of got that consistency where it's not going to let you get it piled much higher than that before it starts to kind of slump off or cave off of, of one of one side or the other. I have worked with a few producers who've tried to do a little bit longer term storage of, of uh, a bunch of different types of sugar beet byproducts and this is a picture uh, from up by the Arthur, North Dakota area of a gentleman that was uh, getting in quite a bit of, uh, in the in the upper left-hand side of the screen, uh, quite a bit of sugar beet pulp. Uh, he was actually mixing this with some grain screenings. Uh, you can 
seat. He basically just kind of piled it in there with a front end loader and then packed it. And he got enough of the screenings and stuff into that pile that he could actually make a drive over pile with it. On the lower right hand corner, that's actually a picture of a similar type of storage operation, but using tailings. And it's a little difficult to see, but you can see that there's a darker color to the tailings. You get quite a bit more soil, obviously, with the tailings. Um, it, on the tailing side, it actually kind of had the consistency of looking like mud when he got it packed in there. It fed okay, uh, but again, I wouldn't um, get real excited about doing this with a lot of, of tailings. Uh, typically, I think you're probably a little bit better off on the tailing side trying to just keep it fed up as you go along. Uh, with the sugar beet pulp, maybe you can make a little bit more investment in, in some longer term storage with mixing it with some other ingredients. I'll show you a few pictures of, of a gentleman uh, over in the uh, Gary, Minnesota area that I worked with uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, this would have been a year, I believe it was 2008, when, when we had uh, quite a bit of excess acreage in American Crystal System when it came to harvest in October. Uh, they were talking about plowing down, I think, about uh, 8 or 9% of the crop. Uh, this guy made a deal with, with a gentleman uh, just a couple miles down the road that, that didn't want to disc under a bunch of sugar beets. So what they did is they actually harvested these beets and brought them into his yard. Uh, these pictures would have been from uh, mid to late October of that year. And so what he did was he set up a little um, apparatus here. He had, he had an old... Uh, fertilizer wagon that he had purchased and uh, what he's doing here is actually dumping these sh whole sugar beets into this fertilizer spreader and that was kind of his metering box and it actually metered those beets into this uh, Old New Holland forage harvester. And So what he's doing here is uh, those beets are coming out of the back end of that fertilizer box. I don't know what rate per hour, you know, probably several hundred pounds a minute, but this uh, Forage chopper is simply chopping the sugar beets, whole sugar beets, into a pile there. And what he would do with them then is he'd haul them out to his cows and calves that were on pasture and just dump them out there with a skid steer loader and, and uh, feed those chopped beets into those cows. And they literally, you can see the picture in the foreground uh, right here. This is where one of those skid steer bucket loaders was. <laughs> And those cows would come in there and lick those beets right up to the ground. I mean, they, they'd kind of make mud with their saliva uh, trying to pick up the rest of those chopped beets. I don't know if you had a big herd, whether that's going to work very well for you or not, but uh, certainly worked pretty well for him. He had about 50 cows uh, and was a great way for him to get rid of, I don't know how many tons of beets he took in off of those acres that his neighbor had, but... Uh, it, it did work well, no choke problems because the beets came out of there in nice little sections out of that forage harvester. This way, I should mention one other thing, if you, if you do this, or I've worked with feedlots in Alberta that have ground, uh, tub ground, uh, whole sugar beets and, and put them into piles for silaging as well. And the, the key to making a silage with these whole sugar beets is to get them chopped to the point where you can get them packed and then mix in some kind of dry fry product, either uh, grain screenings or chopped forage or something else that's going to get your moisture consistency to somewhere around 35% dry matter, 65% moisture. The, the beets themselves are going to be in the uh, 75 to 80% moisture range. If you chop them up and try to pack them, they, they're too wet to make a good silage, uh, and they will ferment. Uh, because of the sugar content, and so if you can get the moisture level right and get oxygen exclusion, you get a pretty nice looking silage with, with putting these beets into a pile and, and packing them. But uh, it, it's a matter of making sure you, you get the moisture and the oxygen exclusion there to be the right consistency. The other thing, you know, when you're dealing with any of these wet byproducts, I, I think we've emphasized it earlier this morning, but the transportation cost here is something that you, you do need to consider. Uh, with, with the increased freight that we're dealing with, uh, moving a lot, especially the wetter byproducts, um, it gets to be a little bit more of a, a cost problem to deal with. And so when you start looking at things like sugar beet tailings where they might be up to 85% water, 
potato waste, those sort of things, you know, understanding the cost of that freight and then calculating in the shrink factor that you get uh, will help you better understand whether or not those wet byproducts are a cost-effective arrangement or not. Like Galen mentioned, if, you, if you're trying to do long-term storage with, with uh, especially the wet distiller's grains and some of these denser wet byproducts, one of the things that you'll experience when you get into trying to do this in ag bags is that because of the density of the product, what happens if you try to put much pressure on those bags as you bag it, uh, those bags have a tendency to want to settle once those baggers move away. And what happens typically when they settle is you end up with a rip and it gets to be a pretty big rip in those bags. And so when you end up with a situation like this, you're either going to have an awful lot of spoilage or you're going to have a, a higher cost storage system because you, you just ruined the bag with, with putting a little too much pressure on it. You can get some of these products to store in covered piles like Galen mentioned. Uh, you can see in the, in the <coughs> upper left hand corner of that picture, even with a covered pile, you're going to have uh, somewhere four to six, maybe eight inches of, of spoilage that's going to happen underneath there with, with air penetration. In, in most cases, what you're dealing with there is not necessarily molds that are going to produce a lot of mycotoxins, like Galen mentioned, but it's a shrink factor. And, and you know, uh, whether or not that's impacting cattle performance looks like it was probably questionable in some of Galen's work, but it certainly does uh, impact uh, the amount of, of dry matter that you're going to ultimately deliver to the bunk because there are chemical changes that are going on underneath that pile. With the uh, liquid byproducts, with any of your um, molasses type products, your condensed distiller solubles, those sort of things, uh, you're going to have to have some kind of a tank and pump system in order to effectively store and utilize those. Some of those products are going to freeze uh, because of their consistency and moisture content. So your options really come down to, you know, can you get them into a, get the tanks into a shed where you can uh, keep enough uh, heat in the building to, to keep them above freezing? Can you get them uh, underneath ground where you can store them underground and keep them from freezing? Some of those products become pretty difficult to pump when they get cold, they get a little bit stiff. Uh, the other thing I'd mention here is what the term that I call feed security, but I worked uh, with a, a case in western North Dakota about seven years ago, uh, working with a gentleman out there who was uh, purchasing condensed distiller solubles uh, out of a plant in central Minnesota. And at the time, you know, diesel fuel was about a buck 75 or so, so hauling all the way out uh, in the western part of North Dakota with those wet byproducts made economic sense. But what was happening is he ended up with a bunch of abortions, a bunch of cattle that died, and, and as they conducted the investigation, uh, the trucking company he was working with was backhauling uh, diesel fuel byproducts out of the oil refinery in Mandan down to St. Paul and picking up these loads of condensed distiller solubles on the way back. And the driver in this particular case did not uh, take the time to clean out the tank like the protocol called for. And the hydrocarbon spikes you could see on the uh, lab work from the samples that came from the uh, tanks of distiller solubles you can see the diesel fuel spike right where it was supposed to be with, with straight diesel fuel. When the veterinarian would come out to do C-sections on these cows, uh, the cows would kind of quit trying to calve in the middle of parturition. They would just give up. He'd come out to do C-sections, and he, could, he said he would sell diesel fuel fumes in some of the cows when he opened them up to do C-sections. And so the speed security issue is, a, is an issue you need to, to pay attention to. Uh, you need to work with a reputable trucking company when you're moving these byproducts, and they, they need to understand that what, what you're buying there is a feed product that's going to ultimately end up in, in cattle that are going to be uh, used for, for food purposes. But this is simply a picture. Uh, this, uh, I think, came from southeast North Dakota. Uh, the tank set up there where they're, they're actually putting condensed distiller solubles into their ration. Uh, so this is a simple uh, plastic tank. A uh, relatively simple pump setup. I got a picture of the pump here too. Yeah, uh, simple transfer pump. Simply pumped it out and over right into the feed mixer that he had. Uh, you know, setup like that you can get done for a few thousand dollars probably to, to set that up. 
when you're dealing with these kind of byproducts, you, you probably want to set your system up enough where you can take a, a tanker load at a time, which would be roughly about 6,000 gallons or so. Uh, it's harder to get, you know, if you can find a neighbor to split a load with where you can do it with one tank, that's great. But typically you're going to end up needing to, to be able to take delivery of an entire tanker load when you do get it. So in, in summary, just in terms of the storage factor here, what, what I would say you need to be aware of is, is these wet byproducts do present some storage challenges. They're not uh, without their, their issues that you have to deal with. You need to take into account the shrink and the spoilage, as Galen mentioned in, in his presentation. Uh, and it's, that's kind of the uh, hidden cost that you don't see in terms of, of what you pay for the byproduct and what you actually end up putting into the bunk. Is there are some costs that go with that. Uh, you know, having some methods to deal with the large volumes of products that you're going to be encountering is, is good. But as Galen pointed out, and I think some of the things I showed you, there, there are ways for uh, people with, with uh, moderate size herds to take advantage of some of these byproducts and get them into storage and have them be cost effective, but you have to be a little bit creative with it. And, you know, with any of these byproducts, you know, looking at the transportation costs and making sure you've got that in the equation is important as well. And I think with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Have you seen any difference in uh, spoilage on pulp versus saline? The question is, have we seen any difference in spoilage with pulp versus saline in, in the we haven't measured that directly. You know, anecdotally, what, what I would say is, is you probably have, uh, with the, the pulp, probably more air entrained into that product, you know, oxygen chance for penetration in there just because of the consistency of it compared to the tailings. Um, and you're, you're exposing quite a bit because of the shredding process when those beets are shredded uh, compared to what the tailings are. Uh, you, you probably have a lot more surface area within that pile that, that's got some oxygen in it for oxygen to penetrate and for spoilage to occur. But we haven't measured any of that directly uh, in any of our research. But uh, we would, you know, like I said, um, you know, when you get uh, in looking at some of those piles, the, the tailings piles actually look uglier than the, uh, in, in just in terms of visual looking at them, my, in my experience, than the, the pulp does. But because of the way that the pulp is cut and, and uh, as it comes off the truck, I think you're going to have more oxygen penetration into those pulp piles than you would with the tailings. I don't think so, but, you know, again, we don't have any data that's really looked at that. Other questions? All right, I'm going to turn it back to Brian. Uh, let's see, at this time we're going to uh, change over a little bit and uh, we're going to get our panel discussion up uh, and talk about uh, some uh, 